Good period. Be a Rembrandt. Be a Rembrandt in here. Again, the principal... Mike McCormick came to Philadelphia determined to patch up the festering wounds of past seasons. The superficial sound and fury of other summer camps was replaced by the solid words of a teacher. There's no secret to our standing line play. It's just coming off the football. Coming off the football. Rolling off that first step. Driving off that first step. We come off, put our head in the belly, and we can block anybody. But we've got to get off on the count. McCormick's camp was strength sapping, but there was a balance struck between sweat spilled and results achieved. <laughs> take off, take offs where you win ball games. Drive off the line of scrimmage. There it is. Oh, good, good, good. Take it, take it. If we, if we dominate. And offensively, we win. If you dominate, hell, there's no secret to it, but you can't get it across to him. God, you just can't. Now, here, let's, let's get this organized. The right man on the right side calls it. Me, 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 or you, you, you. Get it out. Get it out. Through the dog days of July and August, Mike McCormick charted the Eagles' future. When a word, diagram, or a gesture were not enough, he demonstrated a winning technique. By the end of camp, there was no championship glint in eagle eyes, but the seeds of hope were fully rooted, and by opening day, Mike McCormick's Philadelphia Eagles were on the road back. I'm Dick Butkus. You know who I am and what I do. But I want to talk to you about something else besides football right now. I want to talk to you about the Army's new two-year enlistment option and what it means to you. Because you're the one who can get the most out of it. The deal is this. Instead of the usual three or four years, you can now sign up for just two years in today's Army and still have a choice. You can pick the job trading you want, or you can even serve in Europe. Now, any middle linebacker worth his lumps can read that option. It says, go for two in today's Army. Why not talk it over with your Army representative? He's listed in the yellow pages under recruiting. Or call this number toll free. splendid September afternoon, the Eagles opened with the St. Louis Cardinals. It was a forlorn beginning to the season, as all the Eagles' hard-learned skills fizzled into fumbles and the game blew up in their faces. St. Louis bolted to a 21 to nothing lead, and to the 65,000 bird watchers, these new Eagles looked no better than the pale pretenders of other seasons. But with quarterback Roman Gabriel winging it, no game was to be climaxed until the final gun. Gabriel rallied the Eagles to within a point in the fourth quarter, but Philadelphia faltered and lost 34-23. Next, the Eagles met the New York Giants. Led by the leader they called the Messiah, the Eagles hungered to prove that the explosive offense of summer was not an illusion. In 1972, their lame offense ranked dead last in the NFL. But that was before Gabriel and a group of fleet and rangy receivers nicknamed the Fire High Gang. Generaled by Gabriel, the Fire High Gang eased through the giant secondary. Roman's targets ranged from a bandy-legged hurdler like Ben Hawkins to tall trees like 6'3 Don Zimmerman, 6'4 rookie tight end Charlie Young, and 6'8 Harold Carmichael. For the impish giant secondary, it was like defensing the front line of the Boston Celtics. 
Gabriel's passing and a pair of Tom Dempsey field goals kept the game in hand until defensive coach Walt Michaels' trap snapped shut on the Giants. The front line of Will Wynn, Richard Harris, Gary Pettigrew, and Bill Dunstan boiled into giant blue. While the front four swarmed, linebackers Steve Zabel and John Bunting swooped in from the outside and punished dangerous Ron Johnson, number 30. From the secondary, veterans Al Nelson and Bill Bradley and rookies Randy Logan and Joe Lavender strung out Johnson on a clothesline and revived flagging eagle hopes for victory. <laughs> Running back Tom Sullivan punched out 100 yards and a touchdown. And with the Giants leading 20 to 16 with less than two minutes to play, Gabriel fired high to Harold Carmichael. Suddenly, in the swirling dust of Yankee Stadium, the Philadelphia Eagles were reborn as a team, and the 40 men rejoiced in their shared success. But in the final flickery moments, while the Eagles savored their renaissance, they lost their victory. Mike McCormick looked on helplessly as his first win as a head coach flew away on the toe of a Pete Gogolak field goal that tied the game at 23. After a loss to the Redskins, place kicker Tom Dempsey had his moment of doubt and pain. Against the Buffalo Bills on the game's final play, Dempsey missed the winning field goal. In week number five, the winless Eagles trailed St. Louis 24 to 13 until Gabriel began to wing it. Behind 24-20, a pass to Norm Boulash moved the Eagles to the Cardinal 24. From there, Gabriel speared Don Zimmerman with a winning touchdown as time ran out. The first sweet victory was short-lived, as the next week, the Eagles hung tough against the Vikings, but lost 28-21. Against Dallas, the Eagles ganged up on the Cowboys and turned a tough game into a glorious victory. The aroused Eagle hitters toppled Roger Starbuck, heels over helmet, and cowed him into throwing into the teeth of the secondary. Generaled by Roman Gabriel, the offense was a mix of finesse and fury. While Gabe provided the finesse, the fury was dished out by running back Norm Boulash. After 11 straight losses to Dallas, the Eagles routed the Cowboys 30 to 16, and the love affair between a town and its team flowered into full bloom. With a 2-4 and 1 record, the Eagles entered the second half of the season. For John Mays' secondary, 
Walt Michaels linebackers, and Jerry Wampler's front four, the eighth week brought the New England Patriots to Veteran Stadium. A 17-0 Patriot lead dissolved as the Eagles' front four, led by rookie Will Wynn, feasted on Jim Plunkett. The linebackers screamed in on solo blitzes, and the front four poured into Plunkett's pocket and washed over him in waves. Teamwork blended into turnovers. A Bill Bradley hit was converted into a Dennis Wargowski interception as unit play knitted harmoniously into team play. The stubborn eagles seeded storm clouds which burst into a Roman Gabriel to Charlie Young spectacular. Offense, defense, and Dick LeBeau's special teams spell victory as Philadelphia roared from behind twice to dramatically win their second straight, 24-23. When the Eagles went to Dallas, Roman limped off with an injured shoulder, and victory went with him as a 10-0 lead melted into a 31-10 defeat. But Gabe shrugged off the pain and passed Philadelphia to a 2016 win over the Giants. The next week, Gabriel threw for nearly 350 yards against the 49ers, but the Eagles lost 38-28. <laughs> After the disparaging defeat, the Eagles were in an angry mood against the Jets. But even crushing blocks and well-designed plays failed to check a gruesome start as a landslide of turnovers turned into a 17-0 Jet lead. flew back with a mix of short and deep passes. The singles were hit by Norm Boulash, the home run by Harold Carmichael. Three points behind, 20 to 17, the town and the team were one again but they still needed one big play to win it. Pick him up, pick it up, pick it off! The big play was furnished by 165-pound cornerback Johnny Outlaw, the team's smallest player. well-deserved. It goes to probably physically the smallest man on the field, but inside he's the biggest. Hey, hey, hey. Great job, team victory. On to Washington. On the season's final week, victory went to the Redskins. But through the gloom of this bleak afternoon, the Philadelphia Eagles' spirit and fighting heart survived. Roman Gabriel fired well-aimed darts to frozen-fingered receivers. In the fire high gang jettisoned the burgundy and spun through the flakes of this sugar-coated Sunday. From September to December, through sun or snow, on fast or icy fields, no team was able to deny Roman Gabriel 
and the Eagle offense. The 5-8-1 record was not a true barometer of the Eagles' success in 1973. Through 14 games, they were never outclassed, out-hustled, or out-fought. They were a team that never quit. I uh, want you to be the first to know I joined the Army, so I, I guess it means goodbye. Chris, I want you to be the first to know I joined the Army, so I guess this means goodbye. Oh, wow. Oh. Susie. I want you to be the first to know I've joined the army, so I guess it's goodbye. Goodbye? Ginny, I wanted you to be the first to know. I joined the army, so I guess it's goodbye. No, honey. Linda, I want you to be the first to know I've joined the army, so I guess it means goodbye. Oh, Rod. Al, uh, I mean, Ellen. I want you to... With the Army's delayed entry program, you can enlist now and take up to six months to say goodbye. When did you join? Oh, um, actually, last July. For more information on enlistment options in today's Army, call this number, toll free. The rock master builder Mike McCormick chose to build a winner on was a quarterback many thought was sore-armed and sapped of his competitive juices. But in Philadelphia, Roman Gabriel's skills overflowed. And what Mike McCormick knew all along was that Gabriel would provide leadership to a young offense not truly battle-hardened. Gabriel brought with him from the Rams skills polished over 11 years and the mental toughness that comes with playing in must games for a contending team. From the start, Gabe quelled the cynical charges as his new home gave him a new challenge and a springy whip to his off-questioned right arm. His body of fans grew into legions and his teammates elected him captain for the first time in his career. In front of Gabriel, line coach John Sandusky placed a suspect group. But the thin white line of Steve Smith, Wade Key, Mark Norquist, Guy Morris, Vern Winfield, and number one draft choice, Jerry Sizemore, grew solid as they weaned on charges of all pros like Claude Humphrey of the Falcons. Besides forging an offensive line, the Eagles rebuilt their backfield. When assistant coach John Idzik came from Baltimore, he took number 36 Norm Boulash with him. Big Boo brought along hands that caught nearly 50 passes, a blacksmith's body and sprinter's speed. When Boo needed a breather, second year back, Poe James filled the breach with gusto and a ground-eating stride. The man who made the ground game go was Tom Sullivan. In 1972, unlucky number 13 haunted Sullivan. He played in 13 games and carried the ball 13 times for 13 pitiful yards. But in 1973, the hip-shaking, tackle-breaking second-year man rushed for 968 yards and caught 50 passes for 400 yards more. When Mike McCormick first inspected Sullivan, he likened him to the Redskins' Larry Brown. And when Sullivan gained almost 140 yards against the Bills, the incomparable O.J. Simpson said, who is that number 25? He sure can dance.
to 14 games and almost a thousand yards, everyone knows the man wearing jersey number 25. He's Tom Sullivan, and he sure can dance. Rounding out the balanced offense was coach Boyd Dowler's fire high gang of Charlie Young, Don Zimmerman, and Harold Carmichael. The rise of Young, a number one draft pick, can be traced to the acquisition of Gabriel and the sudden gush of his own immense talents. Before he ever wore an Eagle uniform, the bodacious Mr. Young cockily predicted that he was already one of the best tight ends in pro football. Instead of eating his words, he ate up footballs, and his 55 receptions ranked him third in the NFC. Young has huge hands that engulf a football and swallow it like a grape. But the difference between Charlie Young and other tight ends comes after he catches the ball. When 1973 ended, his deeds outdistanced his words, and rookie Charlie Young became an all-pro. At 6'8", Harold Carmichael is an ominous target, but for two years he rusted on the bench, looking more like an NBA forward than an all-pro receiver. When Mike McCormick moved him from tight end to wide receiver, Carmichael rose up like a skyscraper and dwarfed defenders. His size and speed turned matchups into mismatches, and he caught more passes for more yards than anyone else in pro football. Carmichael's trademark was the treetop spike, but his value to the Eagles was his ability to fly with the football. The development of Harold Carmichael from an also-ran into an all-pro symbolized the Eagles' progress in 1973. From a question mark in August, the Eagles rated an exclamation mark in December. And after many years, football was fun to play and fun to watch in Philadelphia. It did not take a championship to win back Philadelphia. It just took a professional effort by a professional coach. Mike McCormick could look back on his rookie year with pride. His offense, which ranked last in 1972, rose to second in the conference and Roman Gabriel threw for more yards than any other quarterback in pro football. He gave a runner who gained but 13 yards a chance, 
and Tom Sullivan respond it with almost a thousand yards. But this coach delivered much more than cold statistics because he rekindled the romance between Philadelphia and its team. So for all that and so much more, give three cheers for the Eagles. Ho, ho, for the Eagles, for the Eagles!